residing at Badarpur, New Delhi, married since uh, 2008 and mother's four children. She has completed her higher uh, secondary education. She is a known case of chronic kidney disease on maintenance hemodialysis since 2019. And she is under, currently undergoing thrice weekly hemodialysis uh, via right arm brachiocephalic AV fistula since February 2024 as her current vascular access. She presented for routine hemodialysis uh, with complaints of uh, facial puffiness from past one and a half month. The facial puffiness Anji. was gradual onset, Anji. progressive and increase on non-dialysis uh -huh. days and uh -huh. gradual. Yeah. Yes, sir. Facial puffiness from past one and a half month, which is gradual onset, progressive, usually increases on non-dialysis days and gradually improves after hemodialysis. It is associated with uh, intermittent hoarseness of voice, which usually improves after hemodialysis, and associated uh, chest pain, which is bilateral, more predominant on the right side. There is no history of uh, arm swelling, arm pain, excessive uh, bleeding from AV fistula, drowsiness, headache, diplopia, blurring of vision, or dysphagia, or shortness of breath. She also complains of uh, increase in her dry weight in from past one and a half months, uh, her previous dry weight in the month of December was 42 kg, which has now increased to 56 kg in March. It is associated with interdilatic weight gain of around 3 to 3.5 liters, which was previously used to be 2 to 2.5 liters. There is no history of bilateral low limb swelling, abdominal distension, shortness of breath, either on lying supine or at night, no chest pain, no cough, no hemopsis. Coming on to past history, so in February 2019, she had one episode of syncope at a family event for which she consulted a local physician. Uh, ultrasound was done and she was told to have bilateral small kidneys and she was advised to undergo further evaluation but patient did not comply with the advice and she opted for holistic medication for next two to three months. <clears throat> in June 2019, uh, she started to have bilateral lower limb swelling which was gradually increasing and associated with new onset shortness of breath which was initially on exertion but progressed to difficulty in breathing in lying supine at, and at night. So she visited a local hospital for the same and she was told to have increased serum creatinine with bilateral small kidneys. So she was initiated on hemodialysis after securing right IJV non-tunnel catheter and also uh, AV fistula was made on her left wrist on 26th of June 2019. Right, IJB was done in 2019. Yes, 19, yes, June. So she was uh, prescribed a twice weekly hemodialysis schedule and was discharged. Her AV fistula was started around five weeks of creation and she continued the same prescription for next one and a half month. When in August 2019, she contacted COVID and she got admitted at a local hospital and was managed conservatively. During her stay, she had one episode of abnormal body movement and loss of consciousness after which she was shifted to ICU and after regaining consciousness, she was told that her AV fistula is not working and hence her uh, left IJV non-tunnel catheter was inserted so that she can continue with her maintenance hemodialysis. She was discharged after 15 to 20 days of her stay and within seven days of discharge she again complained of bilateral low limb swelling and shortness of breath then she came to asian uh, in september 2019 and during her stay her uh, hemodialysis uh, prescription was modified and it was increased to a thrice week regimen and with associated and right ijb tunnel catheterization was done in september 2019 from september 2019 to, uh, to 20, april 2023 uh, she remained uneventful, the duration was uneventful. She continued with her maintenance hemodialysis via right IJV tunnel catheter. Although in the meantime, she was counseled for, uh, repeatedly counseled for uh, AVF creation, but patient refused for the same. And in April 2023, she complained of uh, fever and ch uh, chills during the last few hemodialysis session. So blood culture was sent from peripheral and central line and it showed growth of enterococcus and she was started on IV antibiotics as per sensitivity and despite giving IV antibiotics she remained febrile so for further evaluation uh, transesophageal echo was done which showed a flagellar mass which was arising from tip of tunnel catheter in view of this 
uh, her IGV tunnel catheter was removed and left femoral non tunnel catheter was inserted for further hemodialysis. So, for long term vascular access, a left IGV tunnel catheterization was attempted, but the procedure was aborted due to resistance felt during guide wire insertion. Following this procedure, patient complained of swelling over neck and chest. So, a CT venography was done, which showed a luminal narrowing of a lower right internal jugular vein and right brachiocephalic vein and a pseudo aneurysm in the right subclavian artery, compressing the left inter uh, sorry, pseudo aneurysm in the left subclavian just, artery. Just say it again, it was a little confusing you said. Yes, sir. Uh, After the uh, CRBCI he had, yes, she had then what? A pressure mass in the transesophageal echo. So, the catheter was removed, right IJV HD catheter and left IJV HD catheter was attempted but uh, was not successful because guide wire could not be negotiated. So, a CT venography was done suspecting she might have a central venous stenosis but it showed the luminal narrowing of a right internal jugular vein and right brachiocephalic vein and a pseudo aneurysm in left subclavian artery compressing the left inter uh, internal jugular vein. So, interventional radiology opinion was taken and uh, she underwent embolization and coiling for the same after which patient improved. Again, she was counseled for AB fistula creation. And no, then where was the catheter put if it could not go in the left? So, she was that time she was undergoing dialysis via left uh, non tunnel femoral catheter. So, they put a femoral catheter? Yes, sir. After removing right, IG, right IJV, we put a left femoral and we attempted left, femor, uh, left uh, IJV tunnel catheterization. And uh, then we also did a USG Doppler uh, uh, for the same and she was advised for right brachiocephalic AV fistula creation in April 2023. But patient again refused for the AVF creation. So, finally we did a left femoral tunnel catheterization on 9th of May 2023. Then again in October 2023, she had been complaining of improper flow, improper blood flow in her tunnel catheter during dialysis. As she required heparin locks and saline flushes during the dialysis uh, to maintain the blood flow. So in the meantime, uh, she also received a urokinase well for 30 to 60 minutes and 3 to 4 sittings in past 3 to 4 months and then again she was told that she needs a AV fistula so finally she agreed and uh, right arm AVF creation was done on 9th of December 2023 which was started on 2nd of Feb 2024. After that she started having complaints of facial puffiness and other complaints. Sir. So no history of uh, diabetes bronchial asthma, any car previous cardiac surgery or any gynecological intervention. There is no history of UTI in childhood. Uh, she is P4, L4 and A2, although no history of spontaneous abortion and uh, abortion were, abortions were conducted via uh, MTP, medical termination of pregnancy. All pregnancies uh, she delivered by normal vaginal delivery and no history of cesarean section. <clears throat> Personal history, uh, she is vegetarian a non-alcoholic, non-smoker, and uric, and normal bladder habit. Vaccination history, she has received vaccination for hepatitis B, influenza, and pneumococcus. Uh, there is no uh, history of any drug allergy, and there is also no history of any renal disease in the family. So this is the sort of history part. So, okay, now we just sum up in a few words for everybody because even it's such a long history, uh, just sum up and tell us uh, that in a patient on dialysis, the sequence wise things that happened in this lady. So, she was diagnosed as a case of CKD. No, ESRD has come on yes. dialysis. Let us stick to that history yes. first. Yes, sir. Right? Later on, we will talk about CKD, we will talk about other management, we will talk about other things. But the main thing that she has come to you was. Here is a patient of end stage kidney disease yes, who was taken up for dialysis yes, initially by a, a temporary yes, line in yes, the internal jugular vein yes, and then a fistula was made. Yes, sir. Okay. Then what happened? Then sir, uh, fistula dysfunction happened in uh, two months after creation. So again a left IJV temporary line was put and then she came to us with fluid overload. 
so we optimize the uh, hemodialysis regimen and uh, permanent yeah, uh, <coughs> tunnel cuff catheterization was done in right IJD in 2019 and she remained stable for next four years although we have advised her to uh, no no now finish so here's a lady with a navy fistula yes, who's had one cannulation on the two cannulations on the right, right. internal jugular by yes. tunneled and non tunnel catheter yes no yes. then then sir in uh, 2023 she had one CRBSI episode following which the catheter was removed the right one was right removed. one was removed and the left femoral temporary catheter was inserted and left IJV was attempted for tunnel catheterization which was unsuccessful so finally she underwent left femoral tunnel catheterization in May 2023 okay so let's and come to this let's okay. come to the AV fistulas first yes. we'll go on to is there anything else you want to tell us in the case the history wise this much yeah anything else you want to tell us Sir, no, in history, sir, this, is, this much is there. Okay. So, there is no question for you. Let's talk to the residents here sitting here. When a patient comes to you for the first time for dialysis, what are the options available to you to get a vascular access? What are the options available to you? How do you get a vascular access? So, what are the options you have? That takes time. A patient has come in your emergency for dialysis. Now, one by one, yeah. So, so which are the veins that you can select for cannulation? Let us complete this. The femoral vein, so the internal jugulars, subclavian, external jugulars, subclavian, and the femoral veins, you can cannulate for your uh, temporary access. Okay. How many of you have put in a catheter? All of you have put in? <coughs> okay. Now, how many of you use an ultrasound to put in a catheter? All of you? Now, who has not used an ultrasound? No. So, when you uh, use an ultrasound probe to look at the vein versus the artery, why do you want an ultrasound? Why don't you do it blindly? So, why don't we do it blindly? Earlier, we should never use the ultrasound. We should just put it in blindly. But what is the problem? Because at one time, we always thought that the vein is lateral to the artery. But now we know that the vein can be on top of the artery, it can be under the artery. So, you should never attempt a central vein cannulation without ultrasound guidance. That's why you do. And how does it look, an artery and a vein on ultrasound? How do you distinguish the two? Okay. Okay. And having punctured, how do you make out whether you punctured the artery or you punctured the vein? Let him, let him say. There may be times when through the vein wall you have gone into the artery. No? So, how will you distinguish, have I punctured an artery by accident? Even though if you have crossed the vein and come to an artery, you can make out the screen. If you are not, then uh, the flow of the blood which you get uh, is finished. You can see Pulsatile. So, how many of you have punctured a carotid? So, almost all of you on the right have punctured, yeah. So, once you know what are the complications, then you feel more safe in cannulating. Okay, now what is the problem about subclavian? Why, do, why aren't we cannulating the subclavian? Okay. 
and more chances of puncturing the pleural space. That's why we don't prefer the subclavian anymore. So these are the temporary accesses available to you. Now when you come to a tunnel catheter, what are the preferred accesses? How many of you have put a tunnel catheter? Oh, very good. Lot of you have put. Yeah, tell me. No, no, no. I am not talking about that. You jumped the gun. I am saying when you put a tunnel catheter, you have put a tunnel catheter? Okay. Where is the tip of the tunnel catheter line? Okay, so that's where your tip must go. And where do the cuffs lie? So what is the advantage of a tunnel catheter over a temporary venous catheter? Prevent? No, one by one. So you think that the infection chances are less because the tunnel gets fibrosed. Second? So why is the longevity more for a tunnel catheter? So the irritation to the vessel wall is not there when the catheter is stable. No, that's why you... And the third point... It is the duration which you can leave a catheter inside. Generally, a temp line is left for how long? So, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, six weeks? What is your practice in your hospital? So, temp lines are left for a shorter duration. They are, that's why they are called temporary lines. Normally, you should not try to extend it to four weeks, six weeks, unless you are back to the wall. Then you should go in for a tunneled catheter. Okay. So, these are the catheters that this lady went through. Right. Now, he said that the second point he made was there was a venous access made. The right arm brachiocephalic fistula was made. Where all can you make a fistula? What are the common sites for the fistula? Yeah, good. So you make of the venous supply in the upper arm, whether you take the cephalic vein or the basilic vein. What is the problem with the basilic vein? Yeah, so these are the sites for the fistula. So they did a fistula at the wrist. Brachiocephalic first they did. Okay. Now when you make a fistula and your patient is on dialysis, what do you check on your rounds in a fistula? <clears throat> How many of you actually take a dialysis room round before your patient's dialysis are started? Is there a practice? No. Nobody goes to the dialysis room. It's a technician who does this. So what should you see in a fistula? Before you start puncturing it, for the first time before you start puncturing, what should you see in a fistula? And then when the patient comes to you for regular dialysis, what should you assess in a fistula? So normally, what is the good fistula? What is the rule of six? Six centimeters thin, six centimeters straight segment, and 
and uh, so please make sure and, uh, the diameter should be dopplers doppler should show a flow of yeah okay so normally these are theoretical things now a person has got a fistula made and the patient comes to you you are not sure if there is an obstruction somewhere that's what this lady had no probably it could have been caught very early so how do you make out an obstruction in an av fistula at a very early stage what is that yeah tell us that No, tell us something more about this test. Who can explain this test better? What is okay? What is the arm elevation test? The vein should collapse. collapse. That means there is no obstruction, outflow, outflow obstruction. Now, what is this two finger test you mentioned? I am not clear. Who can describe this better? Can you tell us on your arm? Come here, come here and, and tell the whole class. Obstruct what? The artery or the vein? Okay. No, I am not clear at all. What do you mean by hyperpercentile? Can do you uh, let him explain that? So I'll tell you. You're you're quite right in your explanation. So basically, you have the fistula, you have the juxtanastomotic area, and you have the body of the fistula, and you have the inflow. So the pulse augmentation test is basically going to tell you about the inflow stenosis. So wherever you have the juxtanastomotic area, you'll go proximal to the juxtanastomotic area and use one of your index fingers and compress on that. Prior to compressing that, you'll use the other finger of your other hand and you will compress at the point of the inflow. So when you see that after compressing, there's hyperpulsatility of your pulse, that means you've augmented your pulse by pressing proximally, that means your inflow is adequate. So this is a test for the inflow, that is for your arterial inflow. So if you have a hyperdynamic pulse, that means if you have a pulse which is more augmented as compared to before you're pressing the fistula, that means you have a good inflow, a good artery. And the other test is the outflow test which is the one that you are talking about. That's the arm elevation test. So how do you do the arm elevation test? Sir, on asking the patient for the arm elevation, the vessels will collapse in the AG fistula. Yeah, so what you have to do is, you have to make the patient lie down straight or maybe sit up in the chair like this with the hand lying low like this. Wait for two minutes, see that all the veins are engorged and then pick it up and hold it for at least a minute. And if you, in, in a normal fistula, what happens is that you should have a collapse of the fistula. That is the body of the fistula and all the veins should collapse. But if you don't have a collapse and if you have areas which are beaded, then you know that there are points of stenosis where the distal runoff is not in place. So that's the, the outflow and the inflow test. Yeah, okay. Uh, after that, you uh, went on to tell us that your patient uh, had fe fever with chills yes, while the patient was on a tunnel <coughs> catheter. Yes, sir. Um, so, what are the things which cross your mind when a patient develops fever with chills on a tunnel or a temporary catheter? The catheter related bloodstream infection. Okay. It can be a dialyzer reaction also. And how do you diagnose catheter-related bloodstream infections? So first is a clinical parameter. The patient should have fever, or shivering or chills during dialysis. Then followed by we should take two blood cultures. 
टू कल्चर फ्रॉम ईच पोर्ट एंड वन फ्रॉम पेट्रल लाइन और फ्रॉम ए डायलिसिस सर्किट ऑल थ्री कल्चर शुड हैव सेम ऑर्गेनिज्म विद सेम एंटीबायोग्राफ एंड देन वी विल से दैट इट्स अ सीआरएस ओके सो योर पेशेंट ग्रू एंटेरोकोकाय नो नाउ हाउ वुड यू ट्रीट दिस एंटेरोकोकाय वुड यू पुल द कैथेटर आउट नो सर so the i don't want to know the dosages of drugs you used the reason for asking you is when will you consider removing the catheter so indication for removing the catheter from is if it's a uh, growth of candida or a gram a staph aureus and pseudomonas and or there is a uh, there is a hint of metastatic infection like endocarditis or osteomyelitis then also we should pull the catheter okay is it possible to have culture negative crbsi so it is possible to have culture negative crbsi how is that in those patients sir there is no other source of infection is found first of all and uh, patient usually presents with fever during dialysis and uh, despite repeated cultures it's come out negative and so in that case also we should consider moving the catheter okay so this is the reason for asking you is that is when will you pull out a tunnel catheter yes. hmm? the next thing you mentioned something about a flagellar mass on echocardiography yes. so when you get a mass on echocardiography what would you think of in a patient who's on a tunnel catheter endocarditis infective endocarditis is that all so so you think of a thrombus versus infective endocarditis yes no so suppose it is infective endocarditis what would you do so we should treat how will you prove first thrombus versus infective endocarditis so culture will be positive in patient with uh, infective endocarditis first of all and uh, generally where is the mass in infective endocarditis <laughs> it's it's on a valve right. or it's on the atrial, atrial wall walls. no so what do you do to diagnose it and the transesophageal echocardiography is done yeah very good and suppose it's a thrombus yes. then what will you do with this catheter other uh, we can try to thrombolyze by giving a rtpa uh, tissue so you right. first try to see where is the thrombus is it a catheter tip thrombus or is it a thrombus attached to the atrial wall yes. no now suppose i tell you it's a catheter tip thrombus now what will you do now we forget about infection we have come down to thrombus at the catheter tip we can try thrombolysis by giving uh, alteplase or urokinase right. for uh, thrombolysis and if not then then so we have to remove the catheter if thrombus is not still there is it safe to remove a catheter which has got a thrombus hanging at its tip what is the problem embolization yeah so then what is the recommendation for that anticoagulation yeah so you anticoagulate anticoagulate the patient for about 4 weeks and then you pull the catheter out right yes okay what are the other problems you get with the tunnel catheter have you all heard of recirculation yes yeah what is that in a tunnel catheter yeah come See, now I got lost in your what you were trying to tell me. So in assess, assess recirculation is defined as the in the pre uh, pre uh, in the arterial limb uh, of the dialyzer we are getting the venous blood mixture. So uh, instead of the venous the blood, yeah, you have seen the outlets of a venous end and of the arterial end of a tunnel catheter. No, sir, it is only the venous blood which is coming. No, no. Have you seen which is more distal, the venous end or the arterial end? The venous end is. yeah so when a recirculation takes place a recirculation can take place how do you detect recirculation so uh, there are 
What machine do you use in your hospital? What dialysis machine are you using? Yeah, so in that next time please go check. You can pick up recirculation from the machine itself. What percentage is recirculation which is going on? So that's why first thing I asked, how many of you have gone into a dialysis room and nobody lifted a hand? So <laughs> please sit down. Okay. So, so another way you can find <coughs> recirculation is by just calculating the URR. So if you have a low, a low URR, uh, that's another indicator of uh, recirculation. Yeah, so now you can just take on. So this is what uh, we had discussed only. Multiple vascular excess failures. Can you summarize one second? Yeah, can you re-summarize? She's a 34-year female, sir. She is a known case of CKD-5 on maintenance tumor dialysis in 2019. Uh, she was initiated by uh, inserting right, uh, uh, right non-tunneled IGBSD catheter. Then the uh, formation of uh, uh, left that was my question. Uh, uh, Radiocephalic uh, fistula in the wrist, which got dysfunctional after about two months of use, and then she underwent right tunnel catheterization three four to five months after her initial uh, after uh, in after three to four months, and that remained for there for four years, and after that she developed CRVSI in 2023. Associated with the uh, flagellar mass, which was attached to uh, the tip of the catheter, so the catheter was removed, and uh, left IJV ST catheterization was attempted but was not successful as guide work could not be negotiated. So, uh, left femoral tunnel catheterization was done, but from, from past three to four months, she was complaining of improper flow in the uh, tunnel catheter. So after <coughs> which she underwent uh, right. Brachis phallic fistula formation in uh, December, which was functional since February. And now she has presented to us with complaints of uh, facial puffiness, hoarseness of voice, and uh, in intradilatic weight gain has increased from past two months. So, so you know, when you sum up, <coughs> all you had to tell us was this is a lady who had multiple catheter insertions. Yes. And now she's come with sign and symptoms of central venous stenosis yes, and failed AV fistulas. Yes. So that we can take the discussion from there on central venous stenosis and everything else to be done for her. Yeah. So why do you think <coughs> she was having all this access problems with her first fistula, then second fistula, and then she develops a thrombus? First fistula, she had a history of hospitalization and she had developed one at that time. Following which she is saying that uh, her fistula stopped working, likely uh, event would have happened at that time, likely a hypotensive episode or a septic episode that could have led to failure of first fistula. So was that a primary failure or secondary failure? It was a primary failure. How do you define primary failure? How do you define secondary failure? So primary failure, uh, secondary failure is after uh, any surgical endovascular intervention, again fistula has failed, that's secondary failure. Primary failure without any intervention after creation of fistula. So once you create a fistula and you want to use the fistula, you've used a fistula once yes, and then it fails, what do you call it? Primary failure or secondary failure? From creation to first use, uh, it's a primary failure. So you have used the fistula once so and it fails in the next. So will it be called primary failure or secondary failure? We will call secondary failure. So, so the definition for primary failure is very well defined. You have defined the definition very well. So it's very clear from the time of creation to the point of first use. Point of first use. Point of first use. If it's it's not functional at that time, then it's called primary failure. So this patient probably had a secondary failure of the first fistula. Now, if this patient had come to you at that time with secondary failure of the first fistula, what would you have done for this patient? So, so this is a secondary failure. This is not a primary failure. So depending upon the time frame, if she had come to us early, we could try embolectomy in initial stages. Otherwise, we would have advised to undergo another AV fistula operation afterwards to create another access at that time. So how will you assess a patient to create an AV fistula? So we do a duplex ultrasound to uh, look for uh, venous mapping and then decide, uh, look at the caliber of the artery and vein. I'm, I'm sure sir never used duplex ultrasound. And still he is creating a lot of fistulas yes. and he would create it for this patient. 
So without a duplex ultrasound, how do you know whether the fistula is fine? Whether you can create a fistula or not? We can Allen's test. No, what, what do you do? You don't start with the Allen's test. The Allen's test is for something else, but how do you assess? Uh, you can apply a tonic and look, look for the veins, uh, how dilated they are, and then we can assess. We do a. So, doctor. where do you apply the tonic? In? Depending on the, sir, the site of the fistula, if we are trying at the wrist, we should apply at the forearm. If we are trying at the forearm, we should apply at the elbow, and if, uh, if at the elbow, then we should up, 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 me down. Yeah, so ideally if you are trying at the forearm, it's yes, always sir. best because the vein runs all the way up. So you should do it at the arm itself. Yes, okay, so you want to not just see the cephalic, you yes. also want to yes. see the yes. run into the basilic. Yes. Basic is, is quite deep, yes. but you can trace the cephalic from the basilic just with your finger once you've applied the tunic. Yes. So you assess the vein first. Yes, sir. Okay, so you find a suitable vein in the forearm, yes, sir. which is in the lower part of the forearm. Now what do you do next? We look for the artery, sir. The uh, artery. We can do a Doppler to see. Uh, no, you don't have the Doppler now. Then we can do the Allen's test to look for okay. the patency of so the So, how do you do the Allen's test? So, uh, we outstretch hand, sir. First, we'll ask the patient to put outstretch hand. Then, we compress both radial artery and ulnar artery. So, they'll be blanching. And we'll ask the patient to. How will there be blanching? Uh, pale so the hand will be pale basically. Yeah, so you have to tell the patient yeah, to, to clench, to clench the fist. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. then we'll uh, leave one artery to see if, if it's complete. Which artery? Ulnar artery first, sir. The ulnar? Uh, ulnar artery. Okay. So if, uh, if it's red, if it's, uh, forgetting the word, uh, if the circulation is good, sir, then... If the blanching disappears? The, the blanching will disappear, yes, sir. Within how much time? Uh, within five to ten, five seconds, sir. Within five, five seconds. Five then seconds. Then what, do you, what do you call that? Uh, what is it called if suppose the blanching goes away? What is it called? Is it a positive test? It's a negative test. What is it? Positive test. It's a positive test. Yes. Sir. What do you do next then? Then we should also check for the radial artery also. Radial sir. artery also. Yes. So if, if what is the modified Allen's test? Uh, we'll use a pulse oximeter for that. No, no. What's the modified Allen's test? So you check only for the ulnar, you don't check for the radial because it's understood that if the ulnar is preserved, you are going to use the radial and even if the radial gets compromised, you have the ulnar which takes care of the entire system. So now you assess the vein, you have assessed the artery and now you want to make a fistula for this patient. Now I say you make the fistula for this patient and this patient undergoes primary failure. Uh, what are you going to do next with this patient now? Secondary failure here, primary failure in the radiocephalic. Then sir, we can, again we have to look for another location for fistulas. Yeah, so you'll go higher up a higher in the brachiocephalic? Yes sir, in the forearm. Okay, now the brachiocephalic also has a primary failure. Then again. So what's happening with your patient? Why is he getting so many primary failures? Hypercoagulable state. Maybe. Hypercoagulable state. What else? Peripheral vascular disease. Maybe. Uh, but you have assessed the artery, you have assessed the vein. What is the commonest cause of primary failure of fistulas? Is it a problem with the inflow, with the outflow, with the juxtanastomotic area? Juxtanastomotic area. So what can be the problems with the juxtanastomotic area? Thrombosis. So why do people get thrombosis over and over again? In the juxtanastomotic area. The turbulent blood flow is there. Turbulent what is the commonest flow. reason for? So it's that surgical technique number one. What else? So what are the ways in which you can anastomose uh, the artery and the vein? So which is the best anastomosis? Side to side, end to side. side. So end to side. End to side is the best. Not side to side. End to side. End to side. What is the problem with side to side? Where does the runoff take place in side to side? A lot of your patients keep on complaining. Steel. Yeah, so you have basically a 
more incidence of getting venous hypertension, steel syndrome when you do a side to side anastomosis. So when you do an end to side anastomosis, what is the sort, sort of anastomosis that is recommended nowadays? So there are like, there is in terms of connectology, that is when you connect the vein to the artery, there are different ways in which you can connect the artery to the vein. Either you can piggy bank it, that is you can have the, the venotomy and the arteriotomy together like this or you could have a loop, that is you could, you could do the venotomy and enter into the arteriotomy like this so that you create a loop. So what is actually recommended now is to do a piggy bank. And are you aware of any new developments in terms of uh, anastomosis? Any special assistances that can help you make good anastomosis? Ellipsis. Uh, What's that? Ellipsis method, sir. What is ellipsis? The single catheter methods are we go into the endovascular and just puncture through the artery into the vein and through the vein to, into the artery and uh, do an anastomosis. Okay, so what, ellipsis is. The device. Is there any other device that we know of? Wavelength Q. So, what's the difference between the two devices? They're both endovascular fistulas yes. and they have nothing to do with. Uh, creating percutaneous fistulas. So there has to be difference in the technology of both the devices. That's why they are marketed separately. So the ellipsis uses the perforator veins in the forearm and creates a semi-grax fistula. Have you heard of grax fistulas? Yes. So grax fistulas basically are using perforators which are the most these are veins which are never punctured, not even by the sister at the forearm. So you can use the perforator to create a fistula. So the ellipsis technology uses the perforators to create an endovascular fistula. And the wavelength Q does what you generally do is either a radio-radial or an ulnar-ulnar. So you have two probes going in together in the wavelength Q and you have a magnetic field and electric uh, electrothermal power uh, that is created between the artery and the vein and where you find anastomosis taking place. In the ellipsis, you have just one single device which goes right through the perforator and causes anastomosis between the radial artery and the perforator vein or the ulnar artery and the perforator vein. And you, the question that I was asking you is about what are the, what are the devices that you are aware of in terms of fistula technology. Have you heard of something called as the VASQ device? VASQ. So the VASQ device is a device which fits onto the anastomotic site and stabilizes the anastomotic site and maintains an angle which is between 60 to 80 degrees. So that way you have you have a lot of literature now on the VASQ device. I think you should you should read about it. It's, a, it's, a, it's something that can be asked in exam too. So now you have primary failure of all the fistulas and now you're going for the central veins now. And you said that there was a problem with this patient with the femoral. Yes. Sir. <clears throat> what was the problem? So the uh, of, uh, blood flow problem is she was not able to maintain the prescribed blood flow. So that's So why issue. do you why why do people get problems with femoral uh, perm cats, femoral catheters? Mm. And how long can you keep a temporary femoral uh, catheter? Temporary the temporary is not more than five days. Sir. So, what does the KDOKI tell you from the 2012 guidelines that how long can you keep a femoral HD catheter? Five to seven days, sir. For all days. patients, walking patients, hospitalized patients, everybody same? It must be different, sir. Anybody? So, you can keep up to 10 to 14 days for hospitalized patients. That is your ICU hospitalized patients. But in terms of ambulatory patients, not more than five days. So then why to keep up a femoral perm cath for such a long time in these patients? And why do you think the flow issues are coming here? So that can be due to development of fibrin sheath that can obstruct the flow or the thrombus formation also. And, uh, you know what is the commonest cause in your dialysis centers? 
what is the quantity of fluid that you use for locking your catheter say if it is a venous catheter in the internal jugular versus a femoral 1.6 ml and what about the what is the length of a femoral permacat 42 centimeter up to 55 up to you 55. go so the amount of fluid that you must use to lock that catheter should be more which is not being done that is why they get blocked all the time besides of course whatever it is yeah just came. So, so that is what I was that is what sir has pointed out that it is very important for us to understand what the length of the femoral perm cath is you cannot just put just 42 centimeters perm cath in all patients. What is the concept of using a femoral perm cath? Where do you have to place the tip of the femoral perm cath? At the inferior vena cava basically. At uh, which point in the inferior vena cava? Renal. Above the renal, below the renal? Above the renal. Above the renal. So, what happens when you use a 42 centimeters for a maybe a 5 feet 6 inches person? Where does it go? You go, does it go above? Does it go below? Likely above 42 centimeter, it will stay low. So, 42 centimeter perm cats, the perm cat insertions are mostly done at a much lower level. Yes, sir. So, they generally would not go and in, in a 5 feet 6 inch or 5 feet 7 inches person, maybe in smaller people, it is it's a good idea to do that. But we use it regularly for all our patients, whether irrespective of what height they are, we will give a 42 centimeter, but that is much easily available in the market. What are the different perm cats you are aware of? When it is a glide path, simple permacat, so then the split, hemo split permacat, it has two lumens, uh, separate lumens and uh, which ones do you use? We use glide path. Sir. We use the glide, glide path is the name of the, so what is the name of the technology of that catheter? Have you heard of something called as hero grafts? Yes. What is a hero graft? Hemodialysis reliable outflow graft. It has, uh, it has two components, arterial component and a venous component. Uh, arterial component is made up of uh, PFTE. PTFE. PTFE. And uh, the venous component is made of nanitol and nitinol. No, nitinol is something that impregnates, impregnates around the... Around the yeah, so, so, so the venous component is almost the same as what you use in your normal catheters. Normal catheter. So, so what what do you do with the hero graft? So it's a, it connects from a radio, uh, artery from a, uh, from arm to directly into the uh, drains from directly into the right atrium. Yeah. So it's used basically to avoid the central venous stenosis around the subclavian area, so that it can it can go directly inside the right atrium and ma maintain the flow. So, so where is the point where you can use the Access. It has a connector, I think, in between. I'm not sure. So it's it's basically nothing but an improved technology of the AV grafts. Yes. So you have a graft that can now bypass a particular area, yes. and combine uh, and just bypass two areas and the stenotic area. You don't have to deal with that. Yes. So you puncture the puncture it like a graft. <coughs> First year, second year. <coughs> first year. Most of you are first year. First and second year. Yeah. So these technologies. So what you know, he's what he's told you are the uh, advances in various techniques that have happened. So I want one of you to get up and tell us right from the basics what we discussed to the advances, so that when you go from here, we finished our time. When you go from here, you should go with a clear knowledge of what great knowledge he has passed on and the advancement of AV fistulas. So who is going to do it? Who is going to summarize? Actually that is the purpose of this class, there is nothing clinical in this. No? So who is going to summarize for us? Let us start from the bedside, who is going to summarize at bedside? What are the things that uh, he told you? At bedside, how do you make out, how do you assess before you make a fistula? How do you assess the patency of veins? 
who will do that? Come, anybody. It doesn't matter if you have... Uh, I think we can do it. You want to do it? Okay. okay. So, bedside side, we should... Uh, what we should look is, first of all, the potency of a fistula by... We can do an augmentation test to look for inflow stenosis or we can do an arm elevation test. So, always start with inspection of the fistula. Uh, we should uh, <coughs> look, feel and then listen. So, first we should look at the fistula, the, if, if it's a straight segment or not, how much the fistula is dilated and uh, is, are there any pseudo aneurysms or any skin skin discolorations at the site of fistula <coughs> and then we should feel for the thrill of the fistula and then uh, thrill should be present throughout the whole segment of the fistula that we should look for and we should <coughs> also look for the pulse of that fistula how does that, that feel if it's hyperpulsatile or a soft pulse or a weak pulse in that way we can also uh, make a judgment if it's uh, inflow stenosis or outflow stenosis then we should listen to that fistula, uh, we should listen the, uh, regarding the brui of that fistula. It should be a soft rumbling uh, brui uh, with both systolic and diastolic component. If it's discontinuous, then it's we should uh, be suspicious of outflow stenosis of that fistula. And, uh, and then if, the, if we are also looking, uh, if there's a candidate for AV fistula formation, then we should Examine the patient in the in the uh, ways like we should first check for the veins, and then we should check for the artery. For veins, we can apply. We should apply. No, let's first go to the first one. You said whenever I go to the rounds now, okay. and there's a fistula, this is what I'm going to look at. Yes. Sir. I'm going to see. I'm going to feel, and I'm going to hear. Yes. Sir. In this one complication that we, we always fear is of imminent rupture. Now, how do you diagnose an eminent rupture? Uh, pseudo aneurysm will be there and the skin over it will be very shiny and we will not be able to pinch the skin at that time. It should be very tight over the fistula. Okay, so when it is thin, shiny, then you start worrying about eminent ruptures. Is there a bedside uh, procedure you could tell your patient that when you are at home and if this aneurysm starts leaking, what you should do? He will have no time to come to the hospital. What will you tell him not to do first? Press yes, on it. You will not tell him to put a tight band proximal to it. What will happen to it? It will bleed more. Yeah, so what will you tell him? What can you tell him on the bedside? On the bedside, what you can do? Have you heard of the cap? No, have you? can you do something with the bottle cap? The cap of the bottle. So, you should tell him to get a cap of the size of that aneurysm which is there. If it leaks from the aneurysm, don't put tight bandages, put that bottle cap on it. And then put a tight band around the bottle cap and rush to the hospital. So he will bleed about 10 ml, 15 ml in that and then it will stop. We have lost patients actually. They have just bled from that eminent rupture site. So always remember that bedside test to tell the patient. Very good. So that's about fistula. Now to assess how, when to make a fistula, <coughs> that second part what he was telling us. Yes sir, we should uh, look <coughs> for a venous and uh, arterial patency. So clinically we can uh, apply a tourniquet just proximal to the site we, where we want to have a fistula and look for the veins, how much they are dilated, are they tortuous or not. And then we can look for the arterial examination by doing an Allen's or a modified Allen's test to look for the palmar arch patency. So on the bedside, how do you make out that the veins are good and patent? So, uh, the diameter should be more than... No, no. How do you make out? So, uh, they should be compressible and... Uh, you should apply a tourniquet. Tourniquet, yes. Sir. No? A BP cuff and see the distensibility of the yes, veins. Doppler and all are subsequently. Yes. Okay, so there are two things you said. Third thing he mentioned was how to create a fistula. Yes, sir. What are the methods he mentioned? So, we can do a side to side or side to end. He mentioned surgical, surgical methods. Surgical methods, yes, sir. And endovascular methods. Sir. Yeah, that's very important yes, because sir. in some places they're doing only endovascular creation of fistulas. Yes, sir. They're not doing surgical creation. Yes, sir. And when you say end to side, which is the end and which is the side? End of the vein and side of the artery, sir. Or is it the other way around? So, sir, end of the vein, side of the artery, sir. Okay, good. So, that's what you should know. 
And suppose you make a fistula and your patient starts complaining of pain <laughs> yes. in the arm, then what do you think of? You should think of steel syndrome, sir. In the yeah. palm, not arm, in the palm. You should think of steel <coughs> syndrome uh, in that patient. Yes. Then what will you do? So in steel syndromes, uh, so there are four stages and we should categorize that patient according to that and then we will decide if he, need, if he needs a surgical intervention or not. If there is a pain while just doing exercise, the ball exercise, we can wait and observe. And if the patient is saying pain at rest, then it stays three, and then we should think about a surgical intervention in that patient. And what do you do surgically? So surgically, sir, we have uh, different procedures. First is uh, a distal revascularization and internal ligation drill procedure. Okay. And uh, then we have uh, uh, Rudy procedure, sir. This. Fair enough. So, you have to surgically intervene. Yes. Sir. That's what is important. And when to intervene, you mentioned about it. Yes. Sir. Okay. So, these are the two very important aspects of fistula. When you came to central vein stenosis, what are the early signs so of arm central swelling, vein stenosis? Arm, pain, <clears throat> arm swelling and arm pain are, are the, usually the earlier sign in these patients. Later on, he may develop bilateral swelling and then uh, facial swelling, headache. Seizures can also happen, respiratory distress, pharyngeal edema, these are the late stage of collaterals coming on the collaterals anterior coming on chest wall. Well. Yes, <coughs> okay. And then uh, we also spoke to you about catheter related thrombosis yes, sir. and catheter related okay. infections. Yes, In catheter related thrombosis, when it is at the tip, you can do all the procedures you mentioned. You anticoagulate, you use urokinase, you use RTPAs on these patients. But when the thrombus is lying in the atrium, these things they <coughs> don't work. Before you pull the catheter out, anticoagulate and then pull the catheter out. Don't pull the catheter out otherwise. Okay, the, the other thing that we discussed was about how do you make out recirculation no? uh, in a <coughs> central catheter. Yes, sir. What were the two methods he mentioned? <coughs> yeah, next to you. Come. What is URR? So, what is should be the normal urea reduction ratio? 65%. It should be around 60%. What is the cause for poor URR besides recirculation? When you are reusing dialyzers, then you may get a very low URR. There was a question which uh, Dr. Nant asked was, which I was hoping one of you would pop up and say, he said primary failure versus secondary failure. Now here's a patient, you make a fistula, secondary failure, you make another fistula, secondary failure, you put in a catheter that also gets blocked and you don't know what is happening. He mentioned something about hypercoagulable state, but is there something else that you must suspect? Could this patient be having heparin induced thrombocytopenias? How do they present? How does the HIT syndrome present? No, no. What are the clinical men? When do you suspect my patient could be having HIT? Yeah, when they have recurrent thrombosis. I'm not going into what is the two mechanisms of HIT, the early and the late. That is not the preview. But you must think, start thinking on these lines. Why my patients? Vascular excess is getting clotted. And what are the very early signs the technician will tell you that I think there's something. In fact, you'll be surprised the technician tells you that uh, there's a stenosis developing. Prolonged bleeding. So the bleeding does not stop in the fistula. That's when you start suspecting it is happening. Yeah, now you can. Just so, so how do you yeah, how do you generally deal with a patient who comes to you with central venous stenosis? What are the different uh, so we can which. do uh, angioplasty, balloon angioplasty, and with the uh, stent placement can be done after that. So required. these are two different things. One yes. is that you do a venoplasty, venoplasty, yes, sir. and one is you do a balloon, yes, sir. and the third is that you can do a stent placement. Yes. So how do you decide for which patient you want what, as per the literature? Uh, so we should look at the. Uh, 
elastic recoil of the vein if it's uh, more than 50 percent of the recoil then we should consider stent placement in that patient and the recoil you see the recoil in how much time so it's like the example you just you just plastered a patient you did yes. a venoplasty mm -hmm. five minutes we should check uh, for a recoil and how much of recoil is acceptable less than 50 percent 50 percent 50 percent 50 percent is a normal recoil for any patients who undergo central venous plasties that can take place but that doesn't mean you put a stent in there Remember 50, I'm not sure. and what is the kind of stents that you're aware of anybody uh, can answer that question metal stent bear stents then drug coated paclitaxel coated stents and uh, these two stents i'm not aware of and which is the kind of stent that can be used in central veins drug eluting or non-drug eluting dcbs non-drug eluting stents non-drug eluting stents and if you have to do a <coughs> venoplasty then what is the kind of balloon that you want to use the dcb that is the drug coated, coated balloon or non-drug coated balloons i'm asking uh, evidence i'm not non-drug coated balloons non-drug coated so it goes the other way around so when you're using a balloon you use a dcb okay. that's a drug coated balloon and when you use a stent there is no added advantage of using uh, a drug coated uh, stent in stental veins. Any idea what are cutting balloons? So in calcium rich vessels we use a cutting balloon. I'm when you sure. expect a lot of fibrosis, fibrosis, that's the time you use a cutting balloon. Yeah, I think that's enough. You have given them excellent. So I think he's given you an excellent overview of uh, fistula because he makes it himself. And he's seen all these things happening. And I remember in one of our, uh, which international conference was that, you also spoke on this. No? When Barchandani also came, you spoke on this. <clears throat> yeah, so I think it's a very comprehensive, what you all have learned today and gone. Now from your side, any questions? No, so the only lesson I have for you all is please go into your dialysis rooms and start looking at fistulas. That's the only way to learn about this. I think Thank the you. last question that Sir would want to ask you is what he asked me long time back once is that once your patient is on the dialysis machine, how do you, how do you know that the axis is functioning well from the machine? Because you're sitting really far and the machine is there and the patient is getting dialyzed. Yeah, so when the venous pressures are high or the TMP is above the set limit, then that means, yeah. Thank you.